let's get started. Um, it's sunny uh, here in California still, so I um, hope uh, you're all doing okay wherever you are. Um, right, so welcome to session 4A on uh, source models. Um, my name is Vikram Ravi. I'm an assistant professor of astronomy at Caltech. And um, yep, I'm looking forward to sharing the session. Um, so uh, just a reminder to everyone, I'm sure you've all um, heard this a few times now, uh, to ask questions, um, please uh, use the um, Q&A option in Zoom. And for later, um, please feel free to post session, post questions in the Slack channel. Um, I also monitor the Slack channel as we go along, just in case questions pop up there. Um, to the speakers, um, I'll be providing a little warning with three minutes to go. The talks are about 15 minutes long with about five minutes at the end for questions. And so, um, Sergey, would you like to share your screen? Uh, yes, so I hope you can see it. Yes, that looks great. And so let me just, yeah, thank you very much. I'm Sergei Popov telling us about neutron stars as sources of FRBs. Take it away. Well, um, it's three o'clock in the morning in Moscow. So I'm really glad to give this talk in such an unusual time. And uh, I'm going to make a kind of a review uh, what happened uh, since the first burst was announced how we came to the idea of magnetars and where we stand now. So this scheme is a brief history of this path. Uh, so initially models could be divided into two broad groups. Um, one is related to different exotic processes or to exotic modifications of known processes like supernova, GRPs, and neutron stars. And quite rapidly, basing on estimated rate of fast radio bursts and absence of counterparts, neutron stars start to be the best idea, I'd say. And then um, again, um, there were two options. Either um, we're dealing with some known types of transients or uh, people discussed many exotic models related to neutron stars. And uh, in my opinion, the discovery of the first repeater was a very important uh, step at which we understood that most probably we are dealing with uh, neutron stars. And so again, we had two say main choices and I'll discuss it in a little bit more details below. Uh, either we're dealing with magnetar flares, so magnetic energy is the source of energy of fast radio bursts, or we're dealing with um, some kind of giant pulses, but super giant pulses. And in this case, um, the source of energy is related to rotational energy of the neutron star. And again, uh, we had a major discovery a flare from the galactics of gamma repeater. And uh, so now here we are, and we are more or less sure that uh, fast radio bursts are related to magnetars and the source of energy is related to their magnetic field. Uh, still, uh, there are many uncertainties and here I mention just one, uh, which is related to the origin of these magnetars, either they are normal magnetars, magnetars born in core collapse supernova, or they're some kind of exotic magnetars born in a different processes, in coalescence of compact objects, accretion induced collapse or something else. And hopefully in the near future, observations of host galaxies might um, tell us uh, what is um, the actual nature of this magnetars. Um, in this slide, I want to underline that um, many models have been proposed and um, many of them are rejected, but it doesn't mean that these are bad models. Um, many models are really interesting and they can be considered as predictions of some radio transients, which we hopefully can observe in future. So uh, just one slide about these old rejected models. Um, for quite a long time, I would say, um, the model of coalescing neutron stars was quite popular. 
then the module of supermassive neutron stars, um, then several exotic models related to axion clouds passing through magnetospheres of neutron stars, deconfinement of a neutron star, so formation of a quark star, or for example, asteroids falling on the surface of neutron stars. These models were discussed by several authors, but now they can be uh, completely rejected as um, models explaining the majority of fast radio bursts. Uh, so the, the first eliminator of models was uh, the first repeater. And uh, this moment we had uh, some global extinction of uh, models. Uh, definitely if we have repeaters, then all catastrophic models are rejected. Also, uh, the first repeater allowed to identify the galaxy, the host galaxy, and so to measure the distance. Um, thanks to that, we got the exact estimate of the isotropic um, luminosity of fast radio bursts. And again, this helped to eliminate many models. Uh, so um, at this moment, um, models related to neutron stars um, became most popular. And um, the first model related to neutron star proposed was the model related to magnetars. Uh, initially, when we did it in 2007 with Konstantin Pasnov, um, we were just um, showing that basing on the rate of fast radio bursts, on the time scale, on the absence of counterparts in any wavelengths, and on the uh, energetics of these events, we can um, show that um, giant or hyper flares of magnetars are consistent with properties of um, fast radio bursts. And so if a tiny fraction of the total luminosity of these events goes into the radio, then we can explain this phenomenon. Uh, when um, the famous paper by Torton and co-authors appeared in 2013, they also mentioned the um, soft gamma repeaters as sources of um, FRBs, among other ideas, but underlying that this is quite a good possibility to explain the whole population. Uh, the first detailed magnetar model was uh, developed by Yuri Lubarsky in 2014, and it was the synchrotron Meiser emission model. Uh, and these models are working on uh, shocks uh, situated relatively far from the neutron star. Uh, another type of models discussed in these early years uh, were models related to giant pulses. So the idea was um, quite simple. Uh, we know that um, the crap pulsar demonstrates quite strong bursts. And on the left, you see a plot from a recent paper, actually. Um, this is the distribution of the rate of um, crap um, pulses depending on fluence. And uh, the efficiency of uh, these pulses is about 1%. So that's the ratio of the luminosity towards the energy losses. Uh, the luminosity of fast radio bursts is much larger. However, you can rescale magnetic field and periods, and um, you can estimate parameters uh, for which, with the same efficiency, you can potentially produce bursts uh, of the same energy. Uh, however, this model was criticized from different points, and um, one line of this um, critics was uh, related to the energy source. Um, it was shown with different arguments that rotational energy is not the best source of energy for fast radio bursts. And uh, in particular, it's um, very difficult to make uh, really powerful bursts to reach uh, high luminosity um, in this approach. Uh, or you need to have very uh, rapid spin down and this spin down could be rel relatively quickly recognized in observations, especially in observations of the repeater. Uh, so the major breakthrough was related to the discovery of the burst from the galactic magnetar. 
um, the radio burst was uh, detected by CHIME and STAIR2, and uh, four satellites detected high energy burst. On the left, I show data from the CONUS wind satellite. And uh, this flare was quite different from other flares of the same source. Uh, it is clearly visible in the right plot. So um, on one hand, um, this was a clear demonstration that magnetars can produce uh, fast radio bursts. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we had another piece of evidence that uh, not every flare of a magnetar can be observed in radio. So uh, now uh, main models are related to magnetars and uh, there are two main approaches still uh, related to outer shocks or related to magnetospheric processes. There are many um, papers related to both kinds of these models. Uh, so here I show a few figures from the paper by Andrei Belobarodov published in 2019. Um, in all these models related to shocks, it's uh, necessary to have this outer mm, medium, uh, which is actually the source of the radio emission. Uh, magnetospheric models uh, do not need uh, this outer layer of matter. And um, during the last years and even months or weeks, um, appeared many papers with um, I would say more and more strong arguments in favor of magnetospheric models. Uh, I listed several papers and um, they um, stress different points related to uh, models. Um, these can be just burst statistics, uh, high level of polarization, spectral properties, and uh, duration of individual uh, flares, which we already heard um, at this conference. So uh, now one of the main uncertainties is related to uh, these two possibilities. Either we're dealing with uh, magnetospheric processes or uh, something is happening in uh, strong shocks uh, situated far from the neutron star. And uh, I want to mention a few uh, arguments in favor of magnetospheric models. One of them is related to polarization data. And um, in this paper, Lou and collaborators showed that um, the polarization angle is significantly changing during um, bursts of this source. And uh, this feature can be relatively easily explained in magnetospheric models and it's much more difficult to explain it in models related to uh, shocks uh, because in this case uh, most probably we are dealing with the same structure of the magnetic field and it's much more difficult to obtain these very rapid changes in polarization angle. Um, so again, three minutes. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, another important piece of information is periodicity detected for two bursts. And um, this fact, in my opinion, uh, tell us, potentially tell us something about the origin of magnetars, because um, quite often for um, repeating sources with many observed bursts. Mm, people discuss exotic models of formation of these magnetars. However, the same sources demonstrate this periodicity. And uh, if the origin of this periodicity is due to orbital motion in a binary system, then most probably we um, have to exclude exotic uh, origins of magnetars, especially for the source with um, 16 days periodicity, because if this is an orbital period, it's very difficult to um, imagine a triple system in which initially coalescence of two compact objects uh, produce an unusual magnetar, and then the third component um, helps to um, make this periodic signal. Uh, however, there are um, scenarios of binary evolution in which you can produce um, binary systems, quite um, closed systems uh, with magnetars um, 
And in these scenarios, uh, magnetars originated from stars, um, which were tidally synchronized in close orbits. And thus, uh, such situations are more uh, favorable for formation of neutron stars with large magnetic fields. Um, there are several studies related to uh, the rate of fast radio bursts, and it seems that um, general considerations are in uh, correspondence with the magnetar model. So even if we are dealing just with magnetars originated from core collapse, uh, we can explain the rate of fast radio bursts. And uh, from this point of view, the magnetar model has no um, problems, I think. Um, however, now um, there are many results related to host galaxies. And here the situation is um, more tricky. Um, so I'm, I'm mentioning three main results. Uh, on the left, um, there is a figure from the paper by Manning and collaborators. And uh, in this paper, they used the uh, Hubble Space Telescope data on several host galaxies. And uh, this plot demonstrates that actually uh, fast radio bursts follow more uh, stellar mass, uh, not the star formation rate. And um, this somehow can be considered as an indirect argument against uh, the model in which um, FRPs are related to very young neutron stars originated from core collapse. And of course, the major difficulty for um, such a model is the discovery of uh, repeating fast radio bursts in a globular cluster in the M81 galaxy. And um, um, maybe in this case, we really need another mechanism explaining the origin of um, magnetars. So um, I'm coming to my final uh, slide. So at the moment, there are I think, two main questions. Um, one is related to the mechanism and correspondingly to the site uh, where emission is generated. And um, uh, on the other hand, we uh, do not understand completely the origin of these magnetars. So either there are many different types or um, hopefully um, there can be only one. And I hope that this is at least true for the mechanism, but maybe not true for the origin of magnetars. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any questions. I guess I'm not none in Slack and I don't see any in the Q&A yet. Just while we're waiting, um, one, one quick question that I have, I really liked your early slide with the flowchart of models. Um, and I also um, sort of like your very last slide on the, on the, on the number of um, um, plugs that we might use to um, uh, explain, explain the FRB population. Um, if you were to continue this flowchart um, beyond the top two um, possibilities for magnetars at the moment, what do you see as uh, any further categories that we may observationally consider testing? Well, that's a difficult question because um, there are many possibilities. <laughs> and uh, already during sessions at this conference, we heard uh, several talks in which um, people find different subpopulations of uh, magnetars. Um, so, there are some observational results uh, in favor of uh, different subpopulations, but uh, at the moment they are not uh, that solid. So hopefully really, I think uh, we have one mechanism of emission and, uh, and the main uh, population might be explained by core collapse supernova and some exotic sources like the one in the globular cluster can have um, some exotic origin. Uh, so th there might be some peculiar sources because, of course, we were sure that there are other mechanisms to uh, form magnetars and um, it would be quite natural if uh, they are probably more reactive, for example, if they are born due to coalescence of two neutron stars or two white dwarfs. Perfect. Thanks. Um, we, um, just in the last minute or so, we have a quick question from Adam Della. 
Um, so would FRBs with high repeat rates at cosmological distances be required to have lower X-ray luminosities um, as compared, for example, to SGR 1935 in order to have a reasonable energy budget? Um, in particular, if we consider the X-ray to radio luminosity ratio, or can beaming save us? Um, well, I think that both possibilities can work. Um, and, um, but maybe beaming might be more natural in my opinion, um, because uh, if there is a unique mechanism, we can expect uh, maybe not the same uh, ratio of radio luminosity to X-ray luminosity, but at least of the same order. And um, um, then beaming, I think is a better option and maybe uh, observations um, can demonstrate it soon. Awesome. Well, thank you very much and I hope you can get some sleep soon. Um, <laughs> thank you. Great. Well, let's uh, move on to um, Brian Metzger. Uh, Brian's going to be telling us about FRBs from X-ray binaries. Take it away. Whoop, I think you're muted so far. Yeah, sorry, pleasure to be here. I'm gonna be talking about <clears throat> a model for fast radio bursts from accreting X-ray binaries. This work was led by my student, Avin Tridar, who's gonna be speaking in a different session uh, on a slightly different but related uh, topic. Um, so as we've heard, one of the big open questions in fast radio bursts is the origin of the emission mechanism. Um, so broadly speaking, you can divide the models into two classes. There are the near models where the emission is produced within a few neutron star radii in the inner magnetosphere. And then we have the far models where the central engine releases energy in the form of you know, a plasmoid and it goes out at some large distance, there's a shock or reconnection and that produces the uh, fast radio burst. So that could be scales of an astronomical unit or larger. And we could sort of argue until we're blue in the face, which of these models uh, is consistent with all the data. I, I personally think that the, the demise of the FAR models have been vastly exaggerated. Uh, but I think one way forward is, is, is to appreciate that in some sense, the near models are kind of a one trick pony. They're, they, they're associated with neutron star magnetospheres. Um, and you know, by contrast, as I'm gonna argue, the FAR models are a little bit more flexible, not in terms of the physics, they're actually more rigid in the physics, but a flexible in the sense that there could be several different central engines that are creating these plasmoids that go out and make FRBs. So if we start seeing broadly similar FRB properties from distinct engines, including ones where we don't have a neutron star magnetosphere that could implicitly uh, favor the FAR models. <clears throat> so I'm gonna focus on one of the particularly well-studied FAR models that we've already heard about. This is the uh, synchrotron maser emission at a relativistic magnetized shock. So the idea is that this plasmoid goes out into some external medium, which is cold and magnetized, probably eject or ejected earlier by the same central engine and it drives a shock wave into that medium. And electrons that enter the shock, they're compressed, the magnetic field's compressed and they gyrate around that magnetic field coherently. And that produces a precursor wave that goes ahead of the shock. This is the fast radio burst. Um, and this is seen in particle and cell simulations, basically solving Maxwell's equations from first principles in three dimensions. It's robustly seen that shocks put a small fraction, about 0.1% of their energy into a coherent radio burst. So many other mechanisms you've heard about, they, they don't have this level of confirmation in terms of first principles physics. Um, and shocks are ubiquitous in nature. So this is kind of, to some extent, why I've hitched my wagon to this scenario is because it, unless you know, Maxwell is wrong or unless shocks uh, are not happening in nature, um, you know, they, they should exist to some level. Maybe it's not the fast radio burst we've seen so far, but maybe it will be seen. Um, and furthermore, there are many properties of fast radio bursts which are explained by this model. The peak radio frequency is related to the plasma frequency of the upstream medium and the Lorentz factor of the shock. The rate of efficiencies are reasonable. This again comes from the first principle simulations, depends on the upstream magnetization. This is by the way, mostly work done by my colleague, Lorenzo Cerrone. You can get narrow frequency structure from the synchrotron maser and the harmonics could represent you know, subbursts and they will drift downwards in frequency because as the shock wave goes out, it goes into lower density medium, it slows down, and this causes through the Doppler effect, the, the spectral energy distribution of the synchrotron maser to sweep across your band pass. You can get high linear polarization up to 99% for high magnetization shocks. The up, upstream, the polarization angle is 
uh, predicted to be perpendicular to the upstream magnetic field. And if the upfield is organized, it will be fixed. If the upfield is a mess, it could flip. Um, you predict uh, simultaneous gamma and X-ray counterpart, which is the incoherent thermal synchrotron emission from the very same shock that's producing the coherent radio waves. And you can variability, which is essentially as short as whatever the central engine can provide. And just to emphasize this, I want to remind people that gamma ray bursts exhibit sub millisecond variability. But we know that the gamma ray emission is, is not coming anywhere near the central black hole. It comes out on much larger scales. And due to re relativistic effects, it's compressed into to, to shorter time scales. The central engine was, was varying with some periodicity. It's very possible we would see that in the gamma ray burst emission, given our current understanding. And it's essentially the same way you can get short time scale variability within this kind of scenario. So what is the nature of the central engine that is producing these uh, plasmoids? Um, well, as we've heard, we have a great clue from this galactic magnetar 1935 that produced this double peak fast radio burst like transient that was accompanied by a double peaked hard X-ray transient. Um, and you know, I don't think that all of the X-rays from this event came from the shock. We see X-rays from magnetar flares all the time with no fast radio bursts, but they're usually soft X-rays. If you look at the peak of these flares, the emission got very hard and changed its character. And I believe that the peak of these flares, the, the radio and X-rays could have come from the same shock. And the ratio of radio to gamma ray fluence, the energy of the synchrotron photons, the shape of the synchrotron spectrum, the fact, it, the fact it would be a fast cooling synchrotron spectrum, power law, exponential cutoff, um, were, were all predicted essentially. They were all in the literature prior to this discovery. We just retuned them down to the energy of this, this fast radio burst. Um, and the other thing is that this explains why we only saw hard X-rays and an FRB from this event. Essentially, it was because the plasmoid was shot at us. If it had been shot in a, night, a different direction due to the relativistic beaming, we wouldn't have seen either the radio or the hard X-rays. We would have possibly still seen soft X-rays from the inner magnetosphere. And there are arguments against the magnetospheric model. This first X-ray spike would have created a huge number of electron-positron pairs near the central engine. So I fail to see how this second FRB was even produced in this environment. Maybe it's possible to segregate the enormous number of pairs we've created in one sector of the magnetosphere with the, the plasma vacuum that we need essentially in a different part. But I, I, I find it very challenging as you scale this up to cosmological FRBs, it gets even harder. So is the engine always a magnetar? Um, well, what gives me pause? I think it's possible. What gives me pause is the discovery of this periodicity in two of the well-studied repeaters, 180916 and 121102, where the FRBs arrive in these narrow windows every 1,660 days. And there have been many plausible explanations for how a magnetar could do this. I don't want to disbarge them. They're quite, quite reasonable. But we haven't seen any of these or confirmed them yet from galactic magnetars. And now we've seen that you know, some FRBs happen outside of star-forming regions. OK, you can debate if that excludes a magnetar. We've seen them in globular clusters. I've worked on models for how to make magnetars in globular clusters. Um, but it isn't maybe the first thing you would jump to. Maybe it's possible that many or most fast radio bursts are not magnetars. I want to entertain that for the rest of my talk. So again, if you look back to our 2019 paper, magnetars doesn't appear in the title. We just have a central engine in the center that's ejecting a plasmoid. And we say, to some extent, our conclusions are independent of it being a magnetar. Um, so it could be a magnetar. It could be a accreting black hole system. It could be a, a binary neutron star merger, as Naveen will talk about. So I want to focus on my talk on these accreting black holes. So we have a black hole or neutron star, which is accreting from a secondary star at a high rate. And these ideas have been proposed as fast radio burst engines. What I want to focus on is MHD simulations of accretion flows show that a very common occurrence is that a magnetic field line will get twisted by the accretion disk and form a plasmoid that tears off and flows into the uh, accretion funnel of the accretion disk, OK? These plasmoids uh, are the equivalent to the plasmoids that are ejected from magnetar flares, we think. And so the idea of the scenario is that plasmoids ripped off from the inner accretion flow flow out along the, the, the accretion funnel of, of, of a neutron star black hole X-ray binary and interact with the quiescent jet. And it produces through the maser mechanism, or maybe even through reconnection, the, you know, the very same mechanism we're talking about with magnetar is just a very different environment. So what types of accretion rate systems or black hole neutron star masses would you need? So, so what we want to do is we want to be able to explain the luminosities and time scales of fast radio bursts at a minimum. And so essentially, to produce the short time scales of observed fast radio bursts, we need to be talking about stellar mass black holes, maybe neutron stars. But to get to the highest luminosities, the most um, you know, luminous fast radio bursts, we need binaries that are transferring mass at hundreds or thousands of times Eddington even making optimistic assumptions uh, about what's producing the radio emission. 
Um, and so the closest analog we would have to the types of X-ray binary systems we would need to explain the most luminous fast radio bursts are the ULX systems, the ultra-luminous X-ray binaries. How would you get periodicity in this scenario? Well, I think this was first pointed out by Jonathan Katz, but essentially if you have an opening funnel of your jet, the only way you're going to see an FRB is if the plasmoid shot in this opening funnel. But as you go to approach the Eddington luminosity, that funnel gets very narrow. So only if the accretion funnel is pointed towards us would we be able to see one of these FRBs. But if the system is processing, if the black hole spin axis is misaligned with the angular momentum axis of the binary, we know this binary axis, the jet axis, will process. And this is actually seen in XULXs. These are the procession periods, which can range from uh, weeks to, to years. And they're comparable to those we've seen now from two FRB sources. Um, Another thing you can understand with this scenario potentially is the frequency evolution during the active phase of 1809-16 here. Um, so as, as is known, during the early part of the active phase, you see higher frequency radio waves, and then later you see lower frequency waves. And this could be understood as a changing upstream medium into which these plasmoids are interacting. So during because the whole jet is precessing, a plasmoid that's shot off along the instantaneous uh, angular momentum axis of the, of the black hole will actually interact with different parts of the jet because it's kind of bent. So a plasmoid that's ejected early in the active window phase would interact with the core of the jet where the densities are higher and will produce higher frequency radiation, but then at later times it will uh, interact with the sheath and that will produce lower frequency radiation. So you could naturally get some kind of changing, systematic changing based on, on which part of the jet these flasmoids are interacting with. And, and the structure, the fact that MHD jets have angular structure is, is very well understood. What about host galaxies? Well, you can compare the host galaxies of fast radio bursts to those of, of ULX sources. Here I'm showing the star formation rate and galaxy mass, metallicity and galaxy mass. I don't want to claim that these two populations are you know, absolutely consistent, but at least within the uncertainties used to form these populations, I don't think we can say there's a huge difference. For instance, FRBs do extend to lower galaxy masses, but ULX samples are not complete to lower galaxy masses. There may be some hints that the FRBs have higher metallicity than the, the ULX systems. Um, but I think this issue deserves further study. Um, one interesting thing is you see a lot of ULXs in interacting galaxies like the antenna. And one of the lessons uh, from the antenna is that the ULXs, while they correlate with star formation regions, star, for, star forming clusters, they don't occur in those clusters. It's like they're kicked out of the cluster. Um, and so, you know, hearing that maybe we're seeing some offset between star formation and, and location of fast radio bursts, there may be some lessons from, from the antenna. And I was also reminded when I saw this image of Casey Law's 190614, which uh, I believe was localized at high redshift to what could have been uh, basically a collision between two galaxies. There were two galaxies and it was sort of offset from those. So kind of intriguing. Um, this model predicts the existence of radio optical X-ray quiescent counterparts because these ULX systems, due to the powerful outflows from the accretion disk, blow these multi-parsec scale bubbles, uh, which produce radio optical X-ray emissions. Now, at the distances of most fast radio bursts, our upper limits are not sufficiently deep to see a ULX bubble in the radio, except maybe in the case of 180916, but its low luminosity doesn't require a, a ULX accretor. So um, but nevertheless, in the future, if we can localize more nearby sources, we should try to look for extended optical nebula around them that could be associated with these types of binaries. I didn't mention this, but I, I should have mentioned, let me just mention it really briefly. So, so another thing is because of this procession, the FRBs are propagating through what is sort of a curly Q like wind. Uh, I think this will be discussed later in a different, con a different context of, of, of binary models, but this could induce variable DM and, and RM in principle. Uh, okay, final interesting thing. In order to explain the most luminous FRBs in this model, we need accretion rates, which are so high that binary mass transfer theory tells us that they're probably not going to be stable accretion, namely the star cannot be stably transferring mass to the black hole remnant. But that doesn't preclude that they're produced by unstable systems, stable systems that are actually in the process of undergoing a merger where the black hole or neutron star is in the process of falling into the envelope of its companion star and its accretion rates going up uh, in the last you know, few orbits, hundreds of orbits or something, maybe it produces a fast radio burst. And so if we see FRBs, repeating FRBs that exhibit some change in their properties, uh, you know, and then eventually they go away because the, the creator falls into the envelope of the companion, um, then we might expect a little bit later to see an optical or X-ray transient from this merger event. There are things like luminous red nova from stellar mergers or uh, F-bots uh, that, that people have argued could arise, like Kyle, who's later in the session, argued could arise from black holes merging with stars. So, 
So if we see, anyways, if we see an FRB acting weird and then turn off, let's point all of our telescopes there. All right, my conclusions. Um, conclusion one is that first principles kinetic simulation solving Maxwell on the computer show that magnetized relativistic shocks generate coherent radio emission. And I would argue that many of the properties, even those that have been argued against magnetospheric models are consistent, but there are a lot of uncertainties. There are some issues getting very short repetition like we, we saw from Daniela, like 200 milliseconds. I agree that's hard. Relativistic flares, plasmoids and their associated shocks are ubiquitous in nature. Um, magnetars probably produce them. Accretion disk jets probably produce them. The final stages of the coalescence of a neutron star binary probably produce them. So to the extent that these two things are true, we should be seeing FRBs from all types of sources. I focused on accreting ULX-like binaries. Um, the idea in this specific case is that plasmoids ejected into the evacuated polar funnel go out, they collide with the quiescent jet, and on large scales produce the FRB. Um, but however, to explain the most luminous ones, we need high accretion rates. So we're basically driven to considering ULX systems. Um, we could get periodicity from the precession in and out of our line of sight of the black hole accretion funnel. I think there's some similarities in the host galaxies between these two, although that deserves further study. I think you could get phase dependent burst properties during the active window because the plasmoids are interacting with different angular parts of the structured jet. These might, you might get persistent uh, optical X-ray radio counterparts from these ULX bubbles. In fact, I, I worked on models of 121102 as a magnetar that's inflating a nebula, could be ULX inflating a nebula. Um, but it could also be a magnetar. <laughs> Explaining the most luminous fast radio bursts, uh, however, requires mass transfer rates so high that the binaries would have to be merging. And so, you know, they, they eventually, uh, we could eventually see those sources turning off and, and then it could be accompanied by something we could detect uh, quite a ways away as a counterpart. Uh, I'll finish there, thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, we have uh, some questions um, already, one from Jason, which is, uh, what are your thoughts about the fact that SGI 9035 shows these bursts over eight orders of magnitude in radio luminosity? Um, does that, would you say that they would all be from the same emission mechanism or would you invoke different emission mechanisms? Uh, okay, so you're asking if all of them would be, so, so if, if, yeah, I think as you're going down, I mean, if you go down to, to pulsar scale luminosities, I mean, I mean, there's, in principle, there's no reason why the maser couldn't work. I mean, it basically scales, the, 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 the shock takes its cut on the energy. It gets, it gives the maser 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five of the shock energy. So there's no reason uh, I, uh, you couldn't scale it down, but uh, but I would I would say the arguments against magnetospheric models become weaker as you go as you go down luminosity because I think what people don't appreciate is that this, this huge order of magnitude in physics you're releasing so much energy in a magnetosphere to make an FRB from it that you almost have to produce a huge number of pairs um, but that's not going to be the case for lower luminosity events so my objections to magnetospheric models as they get weaker go away so but if we start seeing like identical FRB properties very luminous ones and and subluminous ones that that show the same, you know, all the same spectra, same physics, everything. Um, then, then that may, that may support a magnetospheric model. But um, it's a good question. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks. Let's try and fit two more questions in. Um, first up uh, from Mohit uh, Bhardwaj: um, Is there any frequency dependence in the FRB rates predicted by your model? Frequency dependence. You mean FRBs at different radio frequencies? Yeah. Um, it's hard to say because the freak, basically these, these bursts, they start at high frequency and they drift downwards, but, but some of them may accumulate all the SNR in a narrow band. So it really depends. Yeah, I don't think we have that level of precision because the frequency is set by the density of the jet and you know, that could, could vary quite a bit. So I would guess that you could get all, that there wouldn't be any strong, but of course at low frequencies, there can be absorption processes like free free and other things in the environment that might, might kill things. But but intrinsically, I don't see there be any like strong preference, um, except that typically at higher frequencies, the burst tends to be intrinsically shorter in these scenarios. Cool. Thanks. Um, last question uh, from Stirl is, uh, do these models have a natural way to produce multiple 50 nanosecond subbursts in repeaters um, that would seem to need gammas that vary between 100 to 10 to the 5? Um, I didn't talk about it, but there, there is, th there's beaming upon beaming in these scenarios because, oh uh, boy, where can I, uh, where did I put the little image? 
So even in the rest frame, the post shock rest frame, if you have a high magnetization shock, um, there, there's there is there's beaming, and so so you can get you can get variability, which is shorter than the duration of the of the envelope. But but to get really short time scale variability, you'd need the upstream to be really highly magnetized, and that may, that takes a cut on your efficiency efficiency dropped in, as one over sigma. So. So I think it's possible if we had a very like, you know, if these shocks are because they're radiative shocks, if, if, if they're somehow corrugated and there's some variability induced and because of the beaming in the post-shock frame, you're able to induce do shorter time scale variability. We, we have to really see because there is a cut on, on I think Pawan has been emphasizing this uh, as well, uh, but, but I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's ruled out. <laughs> Uh, because 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 you get yeah even in the post shock frame you have this beaming effect uh, the FRB has to get away from away from the shocks we can talk more still <laughs> <laughs> awesome thanks Brian so there are a couple other questions one from Jason one from Mohit um, Brian I think you can see them um, one's in the chat and one's in the Q and A so I'll let you type the answers um, uh, afterwards okay um, but. Yeah, let's um, move on to the next talk then um, from Chao Chu Li uh, from Nanjing University, talking about periodic activities of um, fast radio burst uh, sources um, from BE X ray binary systems. And this is a recorded talk. And so um, Jason's going to hit go now. Hello, everyone. My name is Chao Chu Li. I'm a PhD student from Nanjing University of China. I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to give this talk. Today, my topic is periodic activities of repeating fast radio bursts from BE X-ray binary systems. This is my outline. First, I will give a brief introduction about periodic repeating FRBs based on observations. Then I will show that periodic activities of repeating FRBs could be produced by BE X-ray binary system from the following three aspects. And finally, I will give a summary. Nowadays, the nature of the repeating FRBs, including their central engines, are still uncertain. Last year, a galactic FRB 2004-28 was discovered from the Magneta SGRJ1935, which is associated with an X-ray burst. This indicates that magnetars are at least one origin of FRBs. Recently, there are two repeating sources showing periodic activities. FRB 121102 with a possible period of about 160 days, and another FRB 180916B with a 16 day periodic activity. The frequency dependent active window of FRB 180916B is about six days and peaks earlier at higher frequencies. The FRB was found to be about 250 parsecond offset from the brightest region of the Near East Young Stellar Clump in its host galaxy. And this Young Stellar Clump is suggested to be the birthplace of this FRB. It would take million years for FRB 180916b to cross the observed distance from this presumed birthplace this is in tension with scenarios that evoke young magnetars. However, such a large offset may be well consistent with the case of the high mass X-ray binaries and OB associations. The average offset is about 400 per second between them. In the binary star system, Zhang and Go use the population synthesis method to study in detail the properties of the companion star. And they find that the companion star is most likely to be a B-type star in order to explain periodicity of FRB 180916b. Here, I'd like to give a brief introduction about the X-ray binary. 
they can be generally divided into two categories of low maze and high maze X-ray binaries according to the donor maze. Uh, the high maze X-ray binaries are mainly distributed on the galactic plane because the companion stars are young. In high maze X-ray binaries, the magnetic field of the neutron star will not deviate from its initial magnetic field, obviously, due to the shorter accretion time scales of the neutron star. And the orbital period can be distributed on a wider range from one day to one year. Notably, there is a subtype of high mass X-ray binary called B X-ray binary. And the classical B star is a main sequence B star with a circum stellar disk. The figure on the top right represents a B X-ray binary. They can exhibit type 1 outbursts, which are periodically peaking at or close to the periastron and covering 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 of the orbital period. The eccentricity of binary orbits can be 0 0.1 to 0 0.9. Their typical orbital period ranges from 10 days to one year. It is interesting that the orbital period and the, the strong magnetic field of the neutron star in the BX-ray binary system are similar to the properties of FRB 1809-16b. This inspired us that a B X ray binary system might be the source of a repeating FRB with periodic activities. And we apply this model to explain the active window of FRB 1809-16b. The two right figures are schematic illustrations of our model. The dotted ellipse represents the orbital of the neutron star. The gray area represents the disk of the B star. In the disk accretion process, an accretion disk would form around the neutron star when it is in the circum stellar disk of the B star and begin to fade during it is out. The interaction between the neutron star magnetosphere and the, the accreted material results in the evolution of the spin period and the, the centrifugal force of the neutron star. This will lead to the change of the stress in the neutron star crust. When the stress of the crust reaches the critical value, a star quake occurs and further triggers FRBs. The waiting time of two star quakes can be estimated by the ratio of the stress relieved during a star quake to the stress buildup rate. When the neutron star is in the B star disk, the interval between star quakes is estimated to be a few days that is smaller than the active window of FRB 1809-16b. And the, the waiting time between star quakes is inversely proportional to the strength of the magnetic field, the accretion rate, and the, the spin angular velocity of the neutron star. When the crust of the neutron star cracks, the magnetic field near the surface would be disturbed and further propagates Earth's often waves into the magnet uh, mag sphere. we can evaluate the energy released by the magnetic energy in the neutron star crust, and it is enough to produce FRBs. When the neutron star is out of the disk of the B star, the accretion will be very weak. The interval between star quakes induced by the radiation of the neutron star becomes much longer than the orbital period, which corresponds to the non-active phase. The lower right figure is the parameter space of period and the magnetic field of the neutron star. With the observed birth rates of FRB 1809-16b, we can constrain the period and the magnetic field of the neutron star to a limited parameter space. The enclosed area is confined by three criteria. That is, the waiting time of star quakes induced by accretion is shorter than 6.1 days. 
and uh, the waiting time of star quakes induced by radiation is longer than 16.29 days and there should be interaction between the accreted material and the, the magnetic sphere of the neutron star. Except for the frequency dependent active window in the figure of the cumulative distribution function of birth rate influence for 1.4 gigahertz and 150 megahertz, we can find more features of FRB 1809-16b. First, at 1.4 gigahertz, the birth rate increases first and then decreases at different phases. Second, FRB 1809-16b is about an order of magnitude more active at 150 megahertz than at 1.4 gigahertz at this fluence range. Third, the fluence of the low frequency burst is higher than that of high frequency bursts. As we can see, the average fluence at 1.4 gigahertz is a few Jensky milliseconds, but at 150 megahertz, it is a few hundred Jensky milliseconds. In order to get the burst rate at different frequencies as a function of phase, we further generate a sample of FRBs that depend on both frequency and the phase and establish a 3D model to describe the density distribution of the B star disk. We assume that the birth rate during the active window satisfies a Gaussian profile as a function of phase. Furthermore, we assume that the birth rates at different frequencies can be represented by a power law function and the, the power law index alpha is negative. The fluence of FRBs at a phase 5 are assumed to satisfy a normal distribution. Here, mu f nu is the average fluence and sigma f nu is the standard deviation. We assume the average fluence at different frequencies as a power law with the power law index gamma is negative. And we have assumed a density structure of the B star disk of this form. It can be represented radially as a power law and vertically with an exponential decay. For each burst, it will be affected by the gas in the B star disk. The optical depth of free free absorption can be expressed like this. When the neutron star is in the disk of the B star, the optical depth of free free absorption along the line of sight would involve with phase. If the optical depth is larger than one, the observed flux of the FRB would be significantly reduced. Since the free free absorption is frequency dependent, the observed active window of FRBs would be frequency dependent naturally. Then, we can estimate the observed fluence of each burst at a certain phase. If it is higher than the threshold of the corresponding telescope, the burst is regarded as observable. The lower right figure is our simulation result of the burst rate as a function of phase. We can see that the peaks of active windows of high frequency and low frequency bursts appear at different phases. Low frequency bursts are appeared uh, later than the high frequency in an orbital circle. Bursts with frequency of uh, 600 MHz have wider periodic active window. Because of the absorption, it had the greatest influence on the burst at 150 MHz, and the burst rate at 600 MHz does not follow the shape of Gaussian model. The above results are consistent with the observation of properties of FRB 1809-16b. We also evaluated the dispersion major contribution from the B star disk. 
we find that it is lower than one parsecond per cubic centimeter when the neutron star is in the B star disk. And this is also consistent with the observation of FRB 18096 in B. In summary, we propose that B X ray binary systems might be the source of repeating FRBs with periodic activities. For the spatial case of FRB 18096 in B, our study showed that the periodic activities, birth rate, and the frequency dependent active window can be well explained. That's all my talk. Thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Chachu. Um, Chachu, I think uh, I see you here. And so please feel free to leave any questions in the Q&A. Um, there's one uh, in the chat here from the panelists. Um, Sergey asks, uh, Chachu, uh, could you please uh, clarify um, if you have a neutron star with a short period and large magnetic field, then perhaps it is not in the stage of accretion, but it might instead be in the ejector stage. Um, do, you, do you have a comment on that? Oh, uh, in our model, because of the accretion, the neutron star, uh, the spin period of the neutron star will change a lot, and this will give a big change of the stress in the crust. So this, this will uh, have a, a small waiting time between two star quakes and produce more FRBs, maybe have a, a, a single neutron star without accretion. Um, they lose their energy just by radiation. This may not produce so many FRBs in, in our model. Great, thanks. Um, as I don't see other questions, um, Sergey, um, as you can unmute, uh, do you have a follow up on that? Uh, well, um, actually, I want to ask uh, once again. I can't understand really uh, because if we have a rapidly rotating neutron star with large magnetic field then simply the relativistic wind and um, electromagnetic waves generated by this uh, object might prevent interaction of the surrounding matter with the magnetosphere, for example. And uh, it's uh, not that clear for me uh, how you organize this additional spin down if you normalize everything to the spin period 0 0.01 second. But we can, of course, discuss it in a slot later. Mm. Or do you mean if the neutron star has a strong magnetic field, uh, they, uh, it cannot accretion uh, too much material because of their, uh, it, uh, its magnetic field? Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I think we better chat in Slack later. Okay. Oh, okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, if there are no further questions, um, I don't think I see any. Um, great. Thank you very much, Chachu. And um, let us move on to Kyle um, telling us about dynamical formation scenarios for um, the globular cluster FRB. Kyle, go ahead, share your screen and kick on. All right, thanks, Vikram. All right, is everybody able to see this screen share? Um, OK, nice. all right, great. So uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to, uh, to speak. Um, so um, I'm going to be talking a bit about uh, this recent FRB that was uh, localized to a globular cluster in M81. So there's a lot of reasons this is a very interesting and exciting event. Um, it's a repeater. It's the closest extragalactic FRB that's been observed. Um, and I think probably the most sort of novel aspect is the fact that it was 
uh, localized to uh, a globular cluster and old stellar population. So in a lot of ways, uh, this event is, is challenging a lot of our sort of understanding of um, FRB formation models. So I'm going to talk uh, sort of specifically about some of the sort of ways um, we expect um, FRB emitting sources could potentially form um, in globular clusters based on our sort of current understanding of, of globular cluster dynamics. Um, so globular clusters are um, sort of characteristically very old and low metallicity populations. Um, so generally speaking, they're at least 10 billion years old um, and uh, at most roughly 10% solar metallicity. In a lot of cases, they're much lower metallicity than this even. So right away, the, um, the detection of an FRB in an, in an old population like this um, immediately poses a big challenge for the sort of um, standard uh, scenario that's emerged where FRBs are powered by magnetars from core collapse supernova. Uh, so in an old globular cluster that's at least 10 billion years old, uh, there are definitely no core collapse supernova happening. So this right away is uh, sort of demanding uh, uh, an alternative formation mechanism for, for these objects. So uh, typical globular clusters contain um, of order 100,000 up to roughly a million stars. Um, I should also mention that um, the globular cluster population of M81 is roughly similar to the Milky Way population. There are roughly 150 globular clusters observed in the Milky Way. M81 probably has a bit more than this, more like a few hundred. Um, but the metallicity and age distribution, as far as we can tell for the M81 clusters, is, is comparable to the Milky Way population. So the Milky Way population is a reasonable proxy for what we expect for the M81 clusters. Um, so clusters have typically 100,000 to a million stars, and they're also very compact. So the typical uh, size scale of clusters is of order of parsec. So this immediately implies there are orders of magnitude more dense um, than the galactic field stellar populations. Uh, so this suggests, and it's now very well understood, that as a result of these high densities, globular clusters are very efficient at producing um, a wide array of stellar sources um, at much higher rates per unit stellar mass um, than uh, you would see in uh, galactic field stellar populations. So uh, what I want to do um, is spend a few minutes sort of um, painting a sort of broad brush picture of our current um, our current understanding of how compact objects are forming in clusters and how compact object populations are evolving in typical clusters, um, just to sort of set the stage for the um, the ingredients we expect are are available to us in old globular clusters to potentially power FRBs. Um, so for a typical cluster, again with roughly a million stars, um, we expect your initial mass function ranges from roughly a tenth of a solar mass up to roughly 100 solar masses. So the most massive stars in the cluster, so anything more massive than roughly 20 solar masses. Um, so these, are, these mass numbers are all very rough. It obviously depends on the exact metallicity um, and various stellar evolution details, but just sort of giving rough, rough order, rough, rough picture, um, rough broader overview here. Um, so uh, for stars in excess of roughly 20 solar masses uh, within the first few to tens of millions of years, um, these stars are going to collapse into black holes. So typically you'll form uh, roughly one black hole per thousand stars. So for your typical million star cluster, you can expect to form roughly a thousand stellar mass black holes. Um, so for a low metallicity cluster, um, these black holes are gonna be relatively massive on the stellar mass scale. So uh, typically 30, um, 20 to 40, roughly 30 on average solar masses. So because these black holes are so much more massive than the average star in the cluster, they're very quickly going to uh, mass segregate to the center. And this mass segregation is a, a natural consequence of dynamical friction, which is operating in any uh, very dense environment like a globular cluster. So this uh, mass segregation and the formation of this dense subsystem of black holes happens within the first roughly 100 million years of the evolution of the cluster. And then on uh, similar time scales, roughly 30 to 100 million years, um, the sort of next most massive stars are going to collapse into neutron stars. So uh, because globular clusters are um, relatively low mass compared to galaxies, um, their escape velocities are relatively low, um, 50 kilometers per second, roughly up to 100 kilometers per second, depending on the mass. Um, so we expect that actually the majority of neutron stars that are formed at early times are going to be ejected from their host cluster. And this is a result of the natal kicks that we expect are associated with um, neutron stars formed in core collapse supernova. So these natal kicks are very, um, are, are reasonably well constrained by looking at 
uh, distributions of pulsars in the Milky Way, so the heights of pulsars above the galactic plane. And um, we expect that, again, because of these high natal kicks, most of the neutron stars that are formed initially are ejected from their host cluster. So we expect that um, uh, you typically form roughly, you'll have roughly a few hundred neutron stars that are actually retained in the cluster and available um, you know, to participate in the dynamics throughout the subsequent evolution of the cluster. Uh, on slightly longer time scales, so starting at roughly 100 million years, 50 to 100 million years, um, and then going all the way through the entire cluster lifetime, the lowest mass stars, um, less than roughly five, six solar masses, are going to evolve into white dwarfs. So you'll obviously form your most massive white dwarfs first, your oxygen neon white, white dwarf, um, which can, um, you know, be as massive as up to, you know, roughly 1.4 solar masses, up bumping up against the Chandrasekhar limit. Um, and then at later times, as the lower mass stars are evolving, you're producing your lower mass uh, carbon oxygen white dwarfs. So uh, for a typical old globular cluster, um, by the time you, you evolve to the present day, you can expect um, in excess of roughly 10 to the 4 uh, white dwarfs. So they're by far the dominant um, compact object population in late, in, at late time. So um, a really important um, sort of um, characteristic or aspect of globular cluster dynamics is what's happening in this inner subsystem of black holes. So um, once these black holes mass segregate and form this dense subsystem of black holes, they're interacting with one another on very short time scales, um, and they're constantly kicking each other through these gravitational interactions. And again, because the escape velocity of globular clusters is um, relatively low, um, it's very easy for these black holes to actually kick themselves out through these mutual uh, gravitational interactions with each other. So we expect that actually the inevitable outcome in, the, in um, at least a fraction of clusters, um, depending on the initial density and other features, is that the vast majority of black holes will be ejected by the time you get to their present day ages, so roughly 10, 12 billion years. Um, so for clusters that are in eventually through all their black holes by the time they get to their present day ages, in the absence of black holes, the massive white dwarf and the neutron stars, and also the massive main sequence stars that are still, uh, still left, are going to now be the most massive population. Um, so in this case, these massive um, compact objects, the white dwarf and neutron stars, are going to mass segregate to the center. And in these clusters, um, you're going to form a very dense subsystem dominated by white dwarfs and neutron stars in the massive main sequence stars. So in the Milky Way, um, roughly 20% of the clusters have reached uh, this configuration, which we call a core collapse cluster. Um, and we expect that these core collapse clusters are sort of the, um, are, are very likely the ideal environments for producing fast radio bursts, um, both because they're the densest, they have the densest, um, the highest central densities, and also for the reasons I just mentioned, um, they're the most likely to have, um, have the neutron stars and white dwarfs um, occupying the densest regions of the cluster. Um, and in terms of producing FRBs, especially thinking in lines of sort of the, the magnetized neutron star formation model, um, source model, you really want your neutron stars and your white dwarfs to be as dynamically active as possible to produce high uh, dynamical event rates for these objects. Um, so with these things in mind, um, the from, from a single observed FRB in M81, you can infer a volumetric uh, density from the observation. So uh, we infer a density of roughly 5 million per gigaparsec cubed. And then if you assume that whatever source is powering this FRB and M81 has um, some characteristic um, active lifetime for FRB emission of tau, um, then you can work out the uh, source formation rate for this particular source um, from simply the volumetric rate divided by this characteristic lifetime tau. Uh, so the basic exercise that uh, we pursue in this in this study that I'm talking about here um, is we use a set of n-body cluster models, um, so tuned specifically to Milky Way clusters. But as I said, these are very reasonable proxy for the clusters in M81. Um, and these models take into account all the gravitational dynamics and also the stellar and binary evolution, all of the ingredients that are sort of necessary for these these steps I outlined on the, the previous slide, pertaining to compact objects and clusters. Um, and essentially what we do is um, within these models, we can calculate the formation rate of various um, mechanisms through which you might potentially form young neutron stars and old clusters. So in this table, I'm um, outlining some of the possibilities we explore. So just as a few examples, um, white dwarf, white dwarf mergers, if the total mass is in excess of the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, these could potentially undergo accretion use collapse and form a young neutron star. Um, also, white dwarf neutron star mergers, neutron star neutron star mergers, and a, a few other scenarios. 
Um, so the basic idea is uh, from these models, we can infer the rate per typical cluster. And then based on what we know about the distribution of clusters in the local universe, we can then infer uh, the volumetric rate density we would expect from clusters um, in the local universe. Um, and then by leveraging this uh, rate density um, and also the uh, volumetric density uh, for the um, inferred from the observed event in M81, we can then constrain the active lifetime that will be required for a young neutron star formed through these models to potentially explain the, um, the observed FRB event. So just as a sort of example, just to sort of uh, drive things home, for the white dwarf mergers, we're, we're constraining um, an event rate of roughly four to 40 per gigaparsec cube per year. Um, uh, and then with this 50, uh, this, this five times 10 to the six per gigaparsec cubed volumetric density from the M81 event, uh, this implies or this requires an active lifetime of roughly 10 to the five to 10 to the six years um, to, for the FRB to be, um, for the source to be an active FRB emitter. Um, so um, in addition to the rates, we can also gain some insight from looking at the energetics um, inferred from the event. Um, so from the, the burst, the total burst fluence and the on source time, we can estimate um, the time average isotropic equivalent luminosity for the M81 FRB. Um, so of course a key, um, a key uncertain factor in this is this F sub R, this um, efficiency factor for uh, how much of the energy is actually going into radio emission. Um, and then we're basically remaining relatively agnostic toward the exact uh, details of how the source is powered and instead just looking sort of broadly at the energy reservoirs that are available um, to potentially power the FRB. So as we heard in um, some of the earlier talks, um, there is a uh, a large reservoir of energy from the net, from the magnetic energy um, of the of a neutron star, and also there's the rotational energy from the neutron star. In principle, both of these are viable energy sources that uh, could potentially uh, power power your FRB. Um, so, uh, a, a sort of useful way to sort of frame this picture is to um, look at things on a PP dot diagram. Uh, so, this here is showing all of the, for reference, um, all of the observed uh, galactic radio sources. Um, and then as you often see in these PP dot diagrams, we're showing sort of the characteristic magnetic field values, um, spin down luminosity and spin down time scales for various regions of the, the PP dot parameter space. Uh, so the first thing we can sort of layer onto this plot is these colored bands here, which are showing the active lifetimes that would be uh, required um, for these various uh, formation mechanisms and clusters that could potentially produce young neutron stars. Um, so just again, as an example, looking at this blue band, the white dwarf, white dwarf merger uh, scenario, uh, we see that these again require an, an active uh, FRB lifetime of 10 to the five to 10 to the six years uh, for these neutron stars to power an FRB in order to reproduce the inferred event rate. Uh, so uh, the next thing we can sort of layer on to this plot is these uh, dashed black curves, which are showing uh, the spin down luminosities that would be required to explain the energetics of the event for a few different um, values of this F sub R, this um, efficiency factor for radio emission. And basically the way to read this is assuming a spin down power model for now, um, the intersection of these dashed black curves with the colored bands um, is roughly the region of the parameter space where you would want to produce a young neutron star um, with these properties in order to explain the event. Um, so just as an example, um, in the white dwarf, white dwarf merger case, these, this blue colored band, um, for a relatively low um, radio emission efficiency, again, it's highly uncertain, um, but um, adopting a relatively low value for now, we, would in, we could infer that um, you would require a neutron star with uh, spin periods of roughly 10 milliseconds, 10 to 100 milliseconds, and magnetic field values of 10 to the 11 to 10 to the 12 gals. Um, and it's worth noting that these are um, consistent with the values predicted from white dwarf merger simulations that are undergoing accretion induced collapse. Um, so this is again, assuming a spin down powered scenario. So assuming a magnetically powered scenario, uh, we can uh, sort of layer on this hatched gray curve in the, the top right um, portion of the plot. Um, so assuming a magnetically powered model, um, you would need a magnetic field strength of roughly 10 to the 14 gauss. So a higher magnetic field strength would mean a shorter magnetic activity lifetime, which then makes it hard to reproduce the event rate, given um, the constraints on the formation rate of neutron stars given uh, these n body models. And for a lower magnetic field strength, uh, you would need a really um, efficient uh, radio emission mechanism to produce the event rate. 
Um, so essentially, a magnetically powered scenario is very viable, um, assuming you can produce characteristics similar to, to these that I'm outlining here. Um, it's also worth noting that um, although maybe not as um, um, well, I, 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 sh I should remain agnostic and not and not judgmental about this statement. Um, so uh, there are large numbers of millisecond pulsars that are observed in globular clusters. Um, and from just a pure energetics perspective, there's a large enough energy reservoir available from a spin down luminosity perspective to potentially power um, an FRB similar to the one observed in M81. Um, in fact, there are actually so many glob um, millisecond pulses observed in clusters and because they have such long spin down time scales, if they are FRB emitters over their entire lifetimes, then it would actually overproduce the event rate based on the M81 event. So uh, millisecond pulsars could be a viable scenario only if they have a relatively small duty cycle for producing FRBs over their total lifetime. Um, so I'll, I'll show my conclusion slide. Um, the main punchline is um, there are a variety of uh, mechanisms um, that are in principle operating in old globular clusters that could potentially explain this event. There's a variety of ways you could potentially form young neutron stars with properties that are consistent with, with what are observed. Um, so I'll, I'll leave my conclusions up and if people have questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Kyle. So that's, that's uh, yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, first question from uh, Bing Zhang. Um, how do the numbers, especially the required lifetimes, uh, change if a few more nearby globular cluster FRBs are discovered in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, you can see from this equation on the second line here, um, the active lifetime is computed simply from the inferred volumetric density from the event divided by the source rate, which we're inferring from our n-body models. Um, so you can see right away if the if the inferred density is changing based on more events, or if there are fewer, if there are no more events observed, you know, over the next decade, and this this rate goes uh, down, um, then. So it, yeah, it's 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 a single event. So it's it's what we have available, but it's certainly it's 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 only a single event. So there's certainly room for for uh, lowering the error bars on that on that um, that, that uh, volumetric density for sure. Awesome. Thanks. Um, right. Uh, next question from um, Shivani Bandari is: um, Could you please comment on globular cluster dis on on I guess, globular cluster disk and halo population, and which population is uh, most likely to host an FRB progenitor? Um, from a purely cluster dynamics perspective, I don't know that it really makes a big difference whether the cluster is in the disk or in the halo. Um, globular clusters in the disk, so there are, there are many, you know, young massive clusters in the disk. Um, but they don't survive nearly as long as globular clusters that are that are observed in the Milky Way, and, and as long as the globular cluster, the age that's inferred for this event. Um, but assuming the globular cluster is able to survive to the present day and have an age consistent with the, the host cluster that's observed for this event, um, you know, roughly 10 billion years, then it really, from a dynamics perspective, it really shouldn't make a difference whether it's in the halo or, or in the disk. Cool. Thanks. Um, I'm going to, I guess, a good bit of time. So I'm just going to ask another one, which is um, in terms of rates, uh, what do you, um, I guess, two things. Do you feel like the host galaxies that we've observed um, so far are consistent with your modeling or at least um, consistent with a significant fraction um, originating in globular clusters? Or do you think that um, only a small fraction might originate globular clusters? Yeah, I mean, it. so certainly uh, the, uh, the core collapse supernova rate is much larger than, you know, you saw the rates on my previous slide there of order 10 per gigaparsec cube per year. So several orders of magnitude lower than the, you know, the, the rate of formation of magnetars from core collapse supernova. So the key is this active lifetime. Um, so if, if, if these events, if these neutron stars formed through these mechanisms have, you know, properties that are distinct from the, ma the, the magnet stars formed from core collapse, such that they're active longer, um, then potentially a, you know, a non-negligible fraction of FRBs could potentially be coming from mechanisms similar to this. Um, 
I don't, I don't know, maybe no, I don't know if I can give a good answer on whether or not the currently available source properties are consistent with galaxies that have large cluster populations. I mean, certainly the obvious thing, you know, lower metallicity older you know, systems are going to be more, more likely to have large cluster populations, but yeah. I don't know if I can give a, 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 a clear answer to that. Yeah, no worries. Um, so uh, I guess Jason has a comment, which you should feel free to respond to, which is that the M81 repeater um, seems to have quite surprisingly narrow bursts compared to other repeaters. Um, uh, so the bursts are typically about 100 microseconds wide in total um, compared to more than one millisecond for other repeaters. And just sort of wondering whether it may be twice exceptional. Yeah, certainly that's 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 a characteristic that that we didn't look into suit into much detail in terms of this analysis. But um, I mean, if indeed the the neutron stars that are you know produced in a globular cluster environment are distinct from those that are you know formed from core collapse, it certainly is reasonable that there are other properties of the FRB that would be distinct from sort of the other populations that are presumably coming from core collapse magnetars. Nice. Um... Actually, one more question has popped up um, again from uh, Bing Sheng, which is, um, can neutron star pairs be ejected from globular clusters and subsequently merge? Um, yes. Um, and for the really the same reasons that black hole binaries are ejected, um, the rate is the rate is, is very low. So um, I think it, I even had in this table the, the neutron star the neutron star neutron star merger rate in these models. So this is assuming all of these neutron stars are happening in the cluster just because this event was localized to a cluster. It was probably not ejected. Um, but the rate of neutron star binaries that are ejected from clusters, at least from these models um, and from other, other groups models as well, is, is, uh, can, is, is of the same order of magnitude as, as the in-cluster neutron star neutron star merger rate. So it happens, but it's, it seems to be a pretty low rate. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, so our, uh, unfortunately, our next uh, talk, uh, which was uh, by Jenny and Zhao from Nanjing University, um, the recording has some technical issues. And so this will be played during um, the B version of this session in about, um, hopefully, precisely uh, 12 hours from now. Um, and so instead, we're going to skip directly to Tomoki Wada telling us about uh, binary comb models for FRB 12.11.02. And so, Tomoki, would you please go ahead and uh, share your screen? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Take it away. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Tomoki Wada at YITP. <laughs> at first, I thank for organizers to giving me uh, this opportunity to talk about our work with Professor Yoka and Professor Tsang. Today, I'd like to talk about the binary core models for FRB 12.11.02. While many people may know about FRB 12.11.02, I'd like to overview some properties of the past. FRB 12.11.02 is the first repeating FRB. The burst rate is shown in this top figure. This is very nice observational result of burst in China. Its burst rate energy peak is at five times <coughs> 10 to 37 L. This is here, top of this uh, Gaussian-like shape. And the, and the fluctuation of the, dis oh, sorry, Fluctuation of the dispersion measure is about six per centimeter cubic times per sec. This is uh, as shown in this figure. Uh, and FRB 12.11.02 uh, shows very high rotation measure, about 10 to 5th power radian per uh, meter squared. Uh, this is also a special property of FRB 12.11.02. And its host galaxy is a dwarf galaxy. Uh, uh, at the, uh, that equals 0 0.2, and its mass is about uh, 10 to 8 power solar mass. The very interesting point of FRB 12.11.02 is the persistent radio counterpart. Its luminosity is about 10 to the 39th power Rx per second in radio band. Uh, it is plotted in uh, is about 10 gigahertz region. And its size is smaller than, oh, oh sorry, 
smaller than 0 0.7 parsec and it is off center. And also FRB 121102 sh shows periodic activity. Its period is about 160 days. The yellow region in the in the uh, right top panel uh, is the active window. FRBs are observable only in these yellow regions, and oh, sorry, as shown in the bottom figure. In one period, FRBs are observable only in this active when active window. Uh, this active window corresponds to this uh, yellow region in the upper, upper figure. And in, uh, the active window is about 50% or more. At first, graduate at all uh, to, uh, 2020 showed that the active window is uh, about 47%. However, in later paper, Cruces at all 2020 showed that the active window is more than uh, 50%. And some models are proposed to explain the periodicity of FRBs. There are mainly two kinds of models. One is the binary model here. The periodicity is realized by the orbital period of the binary. To make the active window, we need some models uh, in which FRBs are emitted on, uh, in some part of orbital uh, period. Uh, it is in this region. The other model is the precession model. And the period of the first radio burst is realized by the precession, uh, precession of the pulsar. Uh, in this model, the FRBs are beamed. And we can observe the FRB when the, this beam uh, is open to us. Other models are also proposed. For example, the spin of the neutron star uh, is the period of the, neutron, uh, of the FRBs. In these models, I'd like to show that the binary comb model can explain the period of FRB 121102. This model is proposed by uh, Ioka and Zan 2000, uh, so, sorry, uh, 121102. Uh, this model is proposed, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, this model is proposed by Ioka and Zan 2020 to explain the periodicity of the uh, first, repeat, uh, first periodic fast radio burst. Using and developing this model, I'd like to show that the period of FRB 121102 is also realized. In the model, one of the binary uh, emit FRB, uh, this is, uh, that is this, this pulsar. We call uh, this FRB emitting source FRB pulsar. The wind of the companion, this, this wind, uh, can scatter or absorb FRBs from the uh, FRB pulsar. In the optically thick wind, this uh, green region, the wind of the FRB pulsar create a funnel and the FRBs through the funnel are observed. This is the funnel and through this funnel, FRBs can be observable to the observer. Then the observed periodicity is realized because in this region, FRBs are observable, but in this region, FRBs are not observed. I'd like to adapt, the, uh, sorry, I, I'd like to use this model to explain the period of FRB 12.2. At first step to apply this model to FRB 12.2, I'd like to evaluate the optical dips of the binary for FRB 12.2. The observed periods determine the symmetry axis of the binary. <coughs> and then the number density of the companion window is determined, like here. Taking for a coordinate shown on the right figure, we can evaluate the optical dips of the system. Basically, the binary is transparent to Thomson scattering, which is not shown here. However, free free absorption and induced Compton scattering of the companion wind makes the binary optically thick. Thus, the wind from the, uh, from the companion, this uh, blue region, basically makes the system optically thick. Then, how the period is realized in uh, optically thick binary. There are three, three, solution, three, sorry, three solutions we found. One solution is the funnel created by the FRB pulsar. This is the original idea of the binary comb model. If the FRB pulsar wind creates a funnel in the companion wind, 
the bus through the panel uh, are observable. In active phase in this red region, in active phase, the line of sight is in the funnel, like this, like this line. Then uh, the FRBs are observable because they are they pass through the funnel. In and in its inactive phase, this blue region, so, sorry, this blue region, uh, the line of sight is out of the funnel, like this, and FRBs are blocked by the companion wind. In this mode, there are three conditions. First, wind must be optically thick for FRBs to observe, sorry, to absorb or scatter the FRBs in its inactive phase. Second, the half opening angle of the funnel, this angle, set C, must be such that the duty cycle can be explained. Third, the funnel, this funnel, uh, must extend radially for FRBs not to be blocked by the companion wind in its inactive, sorry, in its active wind. This is one solution and we call it funnel mode. And other solution is the change of the optical dip, optical dips in the line, in the orbital phase. Uh, the FRB pulsar is orbiting the companion and thus the optical dips along the line of sight uh, in changes in time. For a given eccentricity and observed active window, we can determine the orbital phase where FRBs should be observed, observable. The phase is red in this uh, figure. If the binary is optically thin in this red curve and optically thick in blue curve, uh, then the observed periodicity is realized. The observed active window is explained if binary becomes optically thin in its active phase and optically thick in its inactive phase. We call this solution tau crossing mode. The other solution is the strong FRB pulsar wind. If, I, if, I, sorry, sorry, if, if the FRB pulsar wind is so strong that the companion wind is blue, these blue regions is pushed back as shown in this right figure, the FRBs are basically observable because wind basically do not uh, block the FRBs like these are all and these are it. However, when the companion is in front of the FR pulsar, if the observer is, observer is here, we could not observe FRBs because it, uh, it is, FRBs are blocked by the companion and companion wind. This mode is similar to the eclipse. To realize this mode, the FR pulsar wind is strong enough as shown in the bottom of uh, this slide, like this, as this equation. We call this mode inverse funnel mode. So far, I showed three models to make FRBs of observable in the active window. Later, I will use this model and determine the host binary of FRB 12102. The question is what binary is possible as the source of FRB 12102? We consciously kind of companion stars, uh, sorry, uh, the massive star and the intermediate mass black hole and supermassive, uh, supermassive black holes. <coughs> The, uh, sorry, we, uh, the adopted parameters are shown as he, here, mass and wind velocity. Fixing mass and wind velocity, uh, we put constraints on the FR pulsar's wind luminosity and companion mass loss rate and the eccentricity of the binary. The used parameter about pass are here. First, I'd like to show the supermassive black hole companion case. Here we set the mass 10, uh, 10 to 5th solar mass and the wind velocity 0.1c. The vertical axis represents the wind velocity, so sorry, wind luminosity of the FR pulsar, and the horizontal axis is the mass loss rate of the disk wind of the supermassive black hole. In the funnel mode and tau crossing mode, the cloud region without the dashed line is allowed. This region, these regions. And the color contour shows the eccentricity. The region above the magenta line is also allowed in the inverse funnel mode. The dashed line is excluded because the change in the dispersion measure is, is higher than the observed value. And above this uh, green line or right of this uh, green line is uh, in, in this region, uh, the persistent radio counterpart is explained by the nebula or companion wind. Uh, uh, I'd like to show some detail of this video. First, this uh, small region is allowed by the funnel mode. And 
this region are allowed by the tile crossing mode. And this uh, region is allowed by the inverse funnel mode. So, uh, to summarize, the uh, colored region without dashed line and above the magenta line in, uh, in our binary, is allowed in our binary code mode. In this case, the persistent radio emission is energized by the Asian jet nebula emission or disk wind. If energized by the disk wind, the radio emissivity must be higher than 1 to minus 4. Also, high rotation measure may be due to the high uh, magnetic field near the supermassive black hole, like uh, magnetars in our galaxies. Next, I'd like to show the massive star companion case. We set mass of the companion as 10 solar mass. If we set the wind velocity as 0.01c, the persistent radio emission is not as luminous as that of FRB 12 11 or 2 in this region, in the funnel mode or type crossing mode, these colored regions. And only inverse funnel mode is possible as the source of FRB 12 11 or 2 above this uh, magenta line and this green dotted line. In this case, the persistent radio emission may be energized by the nebula emission. About two minutes to go. Two minutes, thank you. Here is the intermediate mass companion case. We set the mass as uh, 10 to uh, sorry, 10 to third solar mass and the window velocity as 0.1c. The figure shows that intermediate mass black hole can be a source of FRB pulse sorry, FRB 12B1102 in this uh, colored, not dashed region and above this magenta line. I note that the high velocity wind, uh, for example, in this case, 0.1c, is essential for uh, parameter, for uh, constraining, constraining parameters. If we set high wind velocities of the companion, the funnel gets longer and the Changing the dispersion measure gets smaller and kinetic luminosity gets higher. Thus, it becomes easy to be the source of FRB 12B demo 2. This is the short summary of uh, my talk. And at last, I'd like to introduce some scenario uh, that can explain the frequency dependence of the active window. Uh, this feature is detected in FRB 18.09.16. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I, uh, sorry, uh, I don't uh, describe details, but uh, I'd like to overview these models. One possibility is the frequency dependence of the active wind, sorry, uh, one possibility is that the frequency dependence of the active window is due to the companion of the different sensitivity of the different telescope, this yellow line, and the absorption in low frequency. And another possibility is that the frequency dependence of the active window is due to the intrinsic emission mechanism. If the binary of FRB 18.09.16, sorry, sorry, 16, has some eccentricity, the emission, the emission may vary with the orbital phase due to the separation or the window velocity of the companion <coughs> changes. And the active window may change depending on the frequency. Okay, uh, this is summary of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have a question in the Q&A from Mohit, um, um, who asks, um, if he's not mistaken, the binary cone model predicts periodicity in um, the RMs of FRB 121102's bursts, but we've not yet detected one. Um, do you have a plausible explanation for this? Um, uh, I think it is, <coughs> it, the period is uh, also not uh, clear in FRB 12, 11, or 2, because it is less than three sigma. And thus, rotation, uh, I think the uh, period of the rotation measure, sorry, uh, detecting period of the rotation measure would be more difficult than detecting the period of burst, and thus, uh, rotation measures uh, periodicity. Uh, it is not, sorry. Uh, rotation measure of periodicity will not uh, will uh, detected in our model, but not. But now, uh, it is not uh, detected. Awesome. Thanks. Um, 
here. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'm just checking Slack. I don't see any there. Um, ah, Paz uh, asks, um, do you know what is, the free what is the dependence of the eclipsing phase on frequency in known eclipsing binary systems? Uh, sorry, I don't, uh, I don't, uh, I don't know about known uh, binary systems, but in this model, we consider the <coughs> FRB through the fun, FRB, uh, sorry, uh, in this, in this model, we see uh, edge on and the early, at the early phase, the uh, window is uh, very dense and uh, low frequency FRBs would be uh, absorbed, we think, in this model. But sorry, I don't know uh, the observation of eclipsing phase of on frequency. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the great talk. And um, I, Yes, thank you to all the speakers in this session as well, um, in the various time zones and um, states of sleep. Um, it was an excellent session and um, looking forward to more talks and interactions over the conference. Um, I'd like to remind everyone to, um, uh, if, they, if, if, if they're interested, please head to Gather Town for a coffee break and chat with other attendees. And we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.